Now the star belly sneeches had bellies with stars. The plain bellied sneeches had none upon bars. Those stars weren't so big, they were really quite small. You wouldn't think a thing like that would matter at all. It's with these opening lines that the great American author Dr. Seuss begins his classic children's story that actually addresses a very adult topic. At the beginning of the story, the sneeches with stars discriminate against those plain-bellied sneeches that have no stars upon theirs. And then a great entrepreneur by the name of, anybody remember? No? Sylvester McMonkey McBean. Sylvester McMonkey McBean shows up and, and has a solution to this star problem, his star-on machine. So for just $3, a plain-bellied sneech could get a star. Well, this, of course, upset the star-bellied sneeches because they didn't like those plain-bellied sneeches pretending to be like them. Well, this entrepreneur, Mr. McBean, also has a solution for them, his star-off machine for just $10. As the story progresses, this mad cycle of star-on, star-off continues until the Sneeches have spent all of their money fiddling with these stars, and McBean leaves town a rich man declaring, you can't teach a Sneech. But McBean was quite wrong. I'm quite happy to say that the Sneeches got really smart on that day. That day they decided that Sneeches are Sneeches, and no kind of Sneech is the best on the beaches. That day, the Sneeches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon theirs. <laughs> when the book Sneeches and Other Stories was released in 1953, the author intended the book to address the discrimination that was so rampant in American culture. Specifically, the issue of anti Semitism. In 1973, the story joined several other Seuss classics in the animated TV show Dr. Seuss on the Loose. Anybody remember Dr. Seuss on the Loose? Yeah, we old folks. And George. <laughs> In 2007, the National Education Association named this book one of the teacher's top 100 stories for children. The question, though, is what do Sneeches have to teach us about Jesus? And the reason I share the story is because the Sneeches illustrates an issue with which Christ's church has struggled for millennia. The tendency to add our own preferences to the gospel and then expect others to meet our expectations in order to be truly Christian. Over the course of my own experience, I've seen this manifested in a variety of ways. We fought about the right way to baptize people. We fight about the right way to serve communion. We even fight about the right kind of drink and the right kind of bread. We fight about the right kind of songs to sing within a worship service and the right translation of the Bible to read. We fight about the architecture of churches and the clothing that you wear inside those churches. The list goes on and on. At the end of the day, I want to be honest with you, I don't think there's that much of a problem with having preferences about these kind of things. I don't even see that big of a problem with having strong preferences about these things. Nor do I see anything necessarily wrong with choosing to gather with people who share your preferences. The problem, though, comes in when we decide that our preferences are right for everyone. 
when we establish our preferences as expectations that others must follow in order to be accepted by God. And I know we would never say it that way out loud, because that just sounds horrible. But it's pretty obvious by our attitudes and by our actions that we really do believe at times that our way is the right way, and if somebody was really a Christian, they would see things the way we do. Now, this isn't a new problem. This has been a problem in the church right from the beginning. Back in the first century, the biggest issue of debate was this debate between Jewish people with Jewish backgrounds and those with Gentile backgrounds. The Christians with Jewish backgrounds decided that in order for a Gentile to be a real Christian, they still had to maintain the Jewish religious laws and customs. That to be truly a Christian and be accepted by God, you had to be circumcised. And in his letter to the Galatians, Paul addresses this situation in a very forceful way. So I invite you to grab your Bibles and your note sheets and join me at Galatians chapter 1. This week we're going to focus on verses 1 to 10, and then next week we're going to finish this chapter. But as you get there, since not everyone is a, uh, an ancient geography expert, let me give you a little bit of a background. Uh, for starters, Galatia is not a city. Galatia is a region. You can see where that region sits there. Uh, on the uh, southern shores of the Black Sea and then extending through what is modern-day central Turkey. Uh, this is a region in which Paul and Barnabas had spent a lot of time during their first missionary journey. By the way, if you're interested in that story, check out Acts chapters 13 and 14. And you'll read about this dynamic ministry that Paul and Barnabas had, so dynamic that the people of the region thought that Paul and Barnabas were were, well, they were gods in human form. Well, after Paul and Barnabas returned to Jerusalem, there are some Jewish Christians who came through the region telling everybody that Paul was not a real apostle, so you shouldn't listen to him, that he wasn't one of the twelve. And the fact that he's telling you that you don't need to be circumcised, well, that just shows you that he's not a real apostle, because he's watering down the gospel. He's taking away those parts that would be offensive to you as Gentiles in order to make the gospel more palatable. The result, of course, is a great deal of confusion and turmoil. And when Paul receives word about what's been happening throughout Galatia, he's furious. And to correct the situation, he fires off this letter that's written in what comes right through in the reading as a white-hot heat. Uh, let me read these first few verses for you, verses 1 to 10. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is, no, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant 
of Christ. Now, if you've ever returned a rental car, you've driven over those spikes. Those spikes that assure that cars aren't stolen from the lot. They're designed to, to pivot down when you drive forward over it, but if you back up, then you will experience what the sign always warns. Severe tire damage. Don't back up. Well, essentially, that's what we have in this whole book of Galatians. It's as though Paul was standing, waving his arms before the Galatians, saying, don't back up! Don't back up! Keep going forward! Because if you back up, you're going to cause severe damage to souls. You're going to cause severe damage to your own soul. And you'll cause severe damage to the souls of others. Don't. Don't back up. He begins the letter with his standard formula greeting, which is typical of the era, but unlike Paul's other letters to other places throughout the region, he doesn't include words of encouragement, words of congratulations for the good work they've been doing. No, instead, Paul gets directly to the point. And in a single verse, he lays out the essence of the gospel. It's there for you in verse 4. Talking about Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of, our, of God and Father. This is the gospel. No more, no less. God has sent His Son, Jesus, into the world to save us from our sin. His death on the cross has rescued us from this present evil age. And it's not humanity's authority that we need to worry about. God Himself is the authority in this matter. Take anything away from that, and you no longer have a true gospel. But Paul also makes it clear that if you add anything to that, you also no longer have the true gospel. Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Period. Period. And then instead of the words of thanksgiving that are so typical of Paul's other letters, Paul doubles down. And he, he lets people know the danger they're in if they add anything at all to the gospel. And what shocks Paul is not so much that the Galatians have backed up. He's shocked by how quickly they have deserted the one who called them to live in the grace of Christ. How quickly they have turned to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. The grace of God is the sum and total of the gospel. A grace that goes way beyond simply thinking good things of us and going all the way to action. Because of His grace, God, in His sovereign mercy, sent His Son Jesus into this world. Not to condemn us. Not to beat us up and tell us how bad we are. And not to establish some great list of rules that we have to live up to in order for us to be accepted by God. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to save us from our sins. So that the undeserving and the ungodly, by the way, that's me, that's all of us, it is by God's grace and God's grace alone that we, the ungodly, the undeserving, are redeemed, are justified, and are reconciled with God. So Paul asks, what is it that has seduced the Galatians, into, re into accepting a different gospel. And he comes right out and says, it's because of the treacherous deception 
of those who are trying to add their preferences to the gospel and expecting others to live up to their preferences. This, according to Paul, is not just a different gospel. It is no gospel. That those who pervert the gospel in such a way are deserving of God's curse. And he says it not once, but twice, back to back. Anyone who perverts the gospel by adding stuff to it is under God's curse. And those who, are accept, who, those who accept that new gospel are not rejecting God, are not rejecting Paul, but they are rejecting God himself. Whew! Those are some tough words. I'm glad it's just my job to repeat them. I'm glad I'm not the one who said them. Because that could get you in trouble if you start getting that bold. But here's the bottom line. Jesus plus anything equals perversion. And I know that sounds strong, but this is a serious, serious issue with eternal consequences. See, grace and works are not two sides of the same coin. They are mutually exclusive paths towards being justified, towards being reconciled with God. And it's either one or the other. We are either accepted by God because we have faithfully received his gift of grace communicated through the gospel, or we are accepted by God by living up to the laws. It's one or the other. It's Jesus alone, or according to Paul, we are perverting the gospel, creating something that is no gospel at all. Well, brothers and sisters, the good news is the biblical record is really clear. We are saved by grace through faith. Period. It has nothing to do with what we do or don't do. It is purely by grace through faith. And that is wonderful news for those of us who at times in our life have felt like we need to do something to make ourselves more acceptable to God. It's great news. Because those of us who've had those seasons in our lives where we, we feel like, you know, we've got to at least clean ourselves up a little bit before God's ever going to accept us, we've known that no matter how hard we tried, we fail every single time. We've discovered that our best righteousness, like on our very best day, we're still filthy rags. And this is such great news for us, that it's all Jesus, period. It is His grace that saves us. It's great news for those of us who feel like we constantly fall short of God's glory because we do. And we stand in, God, in God's presence as righteous not because of anything we have done, but because when we accept God's gift of grace which He's offered in His Son Jesus, Jesus takes his righteousness and he wraps it around our shoulders. If you want to impress your friends over the weekend, the big theological word for that would be the imputed righteousness of Christ. He, he takes his robe of righteousness and, and he drapes it around us. And because of Christ's righteousness, we have been accepted by God. And it's only by Christ's righteousness that we are accepted. Ah, it's great news. But it's also a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for those of us who, like me, struggle with this age-old tendency to want to establish our preferences as the expectations that others should follow. It's a wake-up call because once we have crossed those spikes in the rental car lot, 
so to speak. It's foolishness to back up. It's dangerous to back up. Doing so results in severe soul damage to ourselves and to the people around us. So we must never, never back up. And so it's perfectly normal and fine to have preferences. It's totally okay to, to have even convictions about how you should be baptized or how communion should be served. Totally okay to have preferences and even defend them biblically about the right translation of the Bible to use or the right songs to sing. It's totally okay to have preferences about the architecture of a building or the clothing that people wear inside of it. What's not okay is establishing our preferences as the expectations others must follow in order to be accepted in the body of Christ. One of the things I love about being part of the Church of the United Brethren in Christ is the way our confession of faith emphatically speaks to this issue. In the article concerning Christian ordinances, we state that the manner of practice is always to be left to the judgment and understanding of the individual. And then we go one step further. Let me show you the rest of the story. And now, page two, in the words of Paul Harvey, it is not becoming of any of our preachers or members to traduce any of their brethren whose judgment and understanding in these respects is different from their own, either in public or in private. Whoever shall make himself guilty in this respect shall be considered a traducer of his brethren and shall be answerable for the same. Now, if those words are a little bit confusing, that's probably because this goes all the way back to the mid-1800s. This has been our standard for a very long time. So let me put it a little more simply. When we establish our preferences as expectations that others must follow, we sin. Oh, and we should be held accountable for our sin. So where do we go from here? Let me suggest a few possible next steps. If you're here this morning and you're one of those people who, from time to time and perhaps even now, have been feeling like you've got to measure up to some sort of rules or regulations in order to be accepted by God. I want to encourage you to receive the gift of grace, pure grace, which God extends to you in His Son, Jesus Christ. For when you place your faith in Christ, you will be accepted by God. And you will experience the peace that your soul has been craving, perhaps for a very long time. Or maybe you're here and you're one of those folks who, like me, has the tendency to expect others to meet you at your level of preference. My advice to us is simple. Knock it off. It's just that simple. We are causing severe damage to our own souls and to the souls of others. And we're not defending the gospel. We are perverting it. Or maybe you're here today and you're realizing that although you're not exactly sure what that being a traducer thing is, you're probably one of them. Because at some point in time, you have either in private or in public spoken critically of someone whose preferences are different than yours. And you've at least insinuated in some way that perhaps they're not as spiritual as you. Because if 
they were, they would agree with you. Well, there's only one thing you can do if that's true. Repent. Go before God and confess your sin and ask Him to forgive you. And then, if it's possible, go to the people that you've offended, whether they know you've offended them or not, and ask for their forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, what is it that God is whispering in your ear? What is God calling you to do as a response to his word? As our musicians come to the platform to lead a song, I want to encourage you to take this time for some reflection. Maybe during this song you want to jot a few notes to yourself on your note sheet about what God's been talking to you about. Maybe you want to spend the time in prayer just either where you are or here at the prayer rail. It's always available to you. Maybe you'd like to just sit and listen to the people around you sing. Or maybe you'd like to just sing yourself. <laughs>